Hi all, this is uh, an episode that Dan and I did with the actor Teo Yu and uh, he actually did the music that you're about to hear for the intro and the outro uh, under his SoundCloud uh, Florence Camerad. He changed the name from Teo Caravan to that one but anyways um, have a listen it's uh, really uh, great to reconnect with Teo over in Korea and uh, I thought that I learned a lot, uh, especially about him and also about the idea of identity and move in the arts and being a citizen of the world. So have a listen. Take care. Because I'm 66 years of age. I'm coming down with a fever I need some cold air on my face Three tries couldn't make me a believer No Walking out through my door Suicide, try number four. Dan, uh, welcome back. This is Ian and Young, the podcast. Uh, this is episode, shoot, I don't even know. Dan, do you have, you have the track? What's that? 28. 28. Very good. We're still, we're still running. And uh, today's a very, very special episode. Uh, we have with us uh, a, a friend I met at Sundance 2015. Um, uh Actor, writer, uh, I guess you do anything. Actor, writer, uh, Teo Yu. Yay! Yay! <laughs> Thank you. Um, I met Teo back in Sundance 2015. Uh, I was a co producer for Advantageous, and he was an actor in Soul Searching uh, uh, by Benson Kim and uh, a director. And they screened their... Benson and, Lee. Benson Lee, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, is that Lee or Kim? Shit. <sighs> okay, back track. I'm going to edit that out. Benson Lee, sorry. As you can tell, I've done my research. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was very... Uh, I thought it was an interesting you know, array of characters. And mm. it was like the first time I saw that, you know, that kind of uh, Asian American story told. And then I... Met, I met the cast uh, after the screening, said hi, and I was just very, uh, uh, what, how can I say? I just thought that when I met you, Tay, I thought that you were very gracious and very, uh, no, very uh, welcoming person, very nice. Uh, oh, thank you. Yeah. I'm trying to be. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I was just, so I was like, so yeah, we exchanged contact and we've been in touch, you know, on and off here and there. I've been following him on uh, Instagram and seen all the cool things he's been doing um so yeah that's uh my like connection here and we're here in seoul which is kind of crazy <laughs> yeah um from like i knew that i was coming to seoul and that i wanted to you know do the touristy stuff but i also wanted to meet up with tail and catch up with him and see how he's doing and i think this was this would be like you know a good platform for that mm -hmm. to, to catch up and mm -hmm. also to hear about like uh, you know your life here in Korea, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll get to know you a little bit more. So. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Dan, anything from you or your end? Uh, nope. <laughs> we could just get it started to about his background and how he got started in acting and how long he's been acting. Sure. So you were born in Germany. Yeah, I was born and raised in Germany. I was. Um, huh? I was twenty years old when I left for New York. Um, I originally uh, wanted to study, like, the, the area that I that I was born in, where I grew up at, uh, it's Cologne, and um, we have like a, like a pretty famous um, physical education kind of college, you would okay. say, yeah. So, um, so, since it's so subject-oriented, you don't need a 
high school, like a German high school uh, graduation diploma, which is kind of the equivalent of the university entrance exam. Okay. So once you have that high, which is called Abitur in Germany. Okay. Yeah. When you finish that, you you basically are allowed to to apply for you know studying uh, law or you know go to higher education for university. Mm. But um, since I wanted to study sports, I just didn't, didn't want to do that. I just like, <laughs> you know, fuck it. I'm just gonna you know stop high school at you know when I'm like 16 and then I go on to that college. Oh wow, but, you're a bad student then, huh? Or yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. I mean, really, I wasn't. I was uh, never really good at school. Okay. Yeah, so I was an athlete, and I told my parents I didn't want to finish high school, and they were like, you know, the conservative kind of Asian immigrant parents that they are. They're like, no, you have to finish it, and, you know, you don't know what you want to do in the future. Mm. I'm like, yeah, I want to do something with sports, and they were like, just finish it. I'm like, <laughs> okay. So I finished it, but I made a deal, and I told them I want to, um, you know, explore uh, another country. I just want to, mm. you know, travel for a year. Yeah. What you know, European students do after after they get their, uh, after they they uh, enter the university or college. Their you know. gap year, I guess. Yeah, their gap, gap year. Gap year, okay. And um, me being an athlete, I mean, most guys that enjoy sports, they either do one of the two things, and one is either watch a lot of films <laughs> or play a lot of video games. <laughs> Oh, and Korea is famous for for both of those. I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, in in Europe, but in Korea, you also you know read a lot of um, comic books. That's like the third thing in Korea. Oh, okay. But um. But yeah. in Europe too, I guess yeah, watch yeah. a lot of movies and uh, yeah, play yeah. video games. I guess that's just yeah. young men around the world. I think. I don't yeah, know. I yeah. guess. So. <laughs> um, so and me being in love with films and having had the luck of. Having having a, a a good, I guess like a good art teacher in in high school. Okay. You yeah. know because my grades were bad overall besides arts and and uh, sports. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Arts and sports, you did well in high school. Yeah, okay. yeah, I did well, and and sometimes when there's an artistic subject coming on in in, in the class of English or in the, or in German class when we would talk about poetry and stuff you know like yeah. for some reason there was like a natural easy understanding for me to understand like the subject matter mm. to understand like like Büchner or or Goethe or you know like like German classic literature or when we would you know talk about Shakespeare mm. it came easy for me to understand that I don't know why okay I mean, it was kind of weird because I was always in denial with like intellectual people it's like <laughs> yeah no you know, I'm not one of those, you know, weird, you know, fuckers, like... Right, right. <laughs> those artsy, artsy so, fartsy people, yeah. Yeah, right. artsy fartsy, like, softies, that kind of thing. Like, art house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so, what I ended up doing after school is, um, I just picked New York, you know, because okay. it's, like, the capital of the world, and then I researched um, acting schools. or oh, Or film schools, because I was like, okay, let's do something that I'm not supposed to do uh -huh. and then go back to my to my uh, normal path which is like sports education and then mm. maybe become a therapist or something like that or a physical therapist yeah okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and um and so, okay um so wait so okay so six so 16 you're thinking about quitting yeah and then, and then, but your parents but made you finish yeah. <laughs> and then you, you took your gap year i guess i took my gap year and, and i ended up in new york you ended up in, yeah okay so that gap year included a travel to different countries and then you yeah no just like i was like no i just want to go to new york <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah i don't care about other countries oh and wow so this is when you're 20 now i guess yeah wow. exactly so oh, interesting so for high school because you took some time, you took your time in high school, because right? they finish in... Germany. Well, I took my time, meaning I was so bad that I had to repeat a year. Oh, okay. Like, you know, that, that was how <laughs> dumb I was. Well, let's put it in another way. Yeah, let's That's put it how more, more, more. uninteresting school to me was. There we then. go. There yeah. we go. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and I mean, I, I still think to this day that, you know... That the German school system is good because I have oh, okay. like a good basis of like a general education. Yeah, yeah. But um, a lack of understanding and finding what I'm supposed to do, mm -hmm. like early on, to really nourish what I believe my talent, like what I now know my talent was. You know, I okay. never knew that when I was younger. So right. I was kind of a late bloomer in terms of the arts. So okay. Yeah. 
Because the one thing, uh, sorry, I was going to say was that we talked in a previous episode with a, a martial artist, Robert, uh-huh. and um, he made a good point that, yeah, it seems like, in, he was talking about the education system in Taiwan, yeah. and it's kind of like, yeah, it's like a uh, very cookie cutter, like everyone has to go through the same program, yeah. but then, you know, like uh, the analogy he made is like, well, uh, if you make a, like, if it's like a animals, right, let's yeah. say the animals, if a penguin is made to like, climb a tree yeah the monkey's always gonna beat the penguin yeah, of right course, yeah. <laughs> so um anyway sorry c- continue i just the made me yeah, think yeah, about yeah, that yeah because yeah. i think that's a problem american school systems yeah. asian school system uh, korea yeah, it's uh, everywhere Taiwan. it's yeah. not individualized it's just generalized and industrialized so yeah, industri- yeah, yeah that's a good that's word the yeah. problem mm. so um yeah i I ended up um, applying for the Lee Strasberg Theater Institute in New York. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I got in in January in 2002. And I only wanted to stay for three months. And then I was like, okay, let's see. I'm just going to do whatever I want to do the rest of the year then. You know, (laughs) maybe traveling then for the rest of the nine months. But... um, after two weeks, I realized um, this was it. Like, hmm. because as an athlete, you know, the reason I excelled in sports was um, to break it down, like, psychologically, I would say, okay, you learn a technique, yeah. you, you become good in it, and you basically reap the benefits of what you're good at, depending on what stage you are. And um, for sports, it was the court. Basketball court. Yeah, the basketball okay. court. Mm. So, um, so once I started um, doing acting classes and doing those like very basic starting techniques and sense memory in front of the class, I realized, um, okay, th- this was actually it. What I felt as an, as an athlete. Oh. Yeah. I just didn't have any chance to ever explore that mm. on on this kind of level. Only. What I like better in it than sports, rather, was that um, I can express myself on an emotional level in, in a much um, bigger, uh, di- in, in, a, in a much more diverse. You okay. know? Mm. So it was simple. You know? yeah. And after two weeks, I just called my dad. I was like, you know what, I'm sorry, I'm not going to return. And I just hung up and used his credit card and I maxed it out. And I, oh, shit. And I... Um, Yeah, and I paid for the school for like two years because I knew once I started learning about sense memory, I knew that instinctively there is no crash course for what I'm about to do. Mm. You know, there's no quick way into it or out of it. It's just like I have to, I have to study this for at least two years to really get it, to get the gist of it. So... Just briefly, Dan, do you know what sense memory is? Uh, your your wife might no. know it. Um, My wife, I'm sure. Probably it's, a acting, it's an acting technique where uh, you try to recreate certain senses based on um, a particular set of circumstances. So uh-huh. do you want, you want, sorry, you want to give it a quick example? No, just no, no, you just, I mean, yeah, yeah, you, yeah. yeah, you explain it like really like on point actually. Yeah, yeah so yeah. I mean, um, there... Uh, uh, there's a there's a book called No Acting Please and it, he talks about how one exercise is like okay you first take the apple right yeah. so so eating eating involves all five senses right so you take the yeah. apple first visually touch it look look at it and then you bite into the apple the taste um, the the smell all all these things and then basically you try to recreate that whole experience of like looking at the apple to eating the apple and digesting the apple so like. Um, just just for our listeners who don't know what sense memory is. Yeah. But yeah anyways. Okay. Yeah. Continue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So basically, it's like you're lying. You're you're lying to yourself until you believe <laughs> uh, the the fake reality that you kind of created. But you know what's interesting? I hear is a lot of actors say the body can't tell the difference, though, right? Like or like, I think intellectually mm. you know that you mm. are playing a role, mm. but your body is if you're crying or mm. you're yelling, mm. you're crying and you're yelling. Mm. Right, but intellectually, you're still in that play zone, I guess, right? Or, I don't know, what's what's your thought on that? Uh, That's well, kind of, yeah. I don't know who said that, but yeah. I would disagree with that. Oh, because, really? Yeah, okay. because it's just as simply put as, you know, what, what um, let me think of something 
general or universal. Okay, when you um, when you're hungry for a while and you imagine what your favorite food is, what you or whatever you you're craving yeah. in that particular moment, mm. and then do just the sense memory of that taste and that smell without even looking the visual thing, without you using the sense memory of of how it looks. Oh, interesting. You know how okay. it, how it's how it tastes, how it smells, mm -hmm. and then maybe use the sense of touch with your lips or your fingertips. Then you will have a physical reaction. Yes. Right. Right. And that's basically what sense memory is. Okay. You know, it's basically evoking that physical and emotional reaction by creating, um, by the sense memory of the physicality of it. Not not going after the result, but only recreating the reality. Oh, the being. Yeah, 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 yeah. The oh. reality of it, like the physical reality of it. Oh, okay. And this is like what we learned in school, what uh, my teacher, Irma Sandri, the late Irma Sandri who passed away, um, mm -hmm. always told us. She was always like sense memory and this whole thing about method acting is not about cre creating the emotion but creating the, the reality of the sense memory. Oh. Yeah, that's why it's called sense memory. It's not, it's not called emotional memory. Oh, interesting. You know? Which is a whole other exercise. But, <laughs> yeah, that's the hardest thing to learn and I think also the biggest misconception of what we learn at Strasbourg. Ah. Yeah. So just, you know, learning um, how to physically recreate that. Yeah. So so you got that, so you saw this and it was like two weeks in. Yeah. So only two weeks of class you're like, holy shit, this is, this is for me. And then, yeah. um, so <laughs> kind of, a, you maxed out your dad's credit card. So obviously he's, he's in uh, Germany at this time. Yeah, or exactly. They're, they're still living in Germany. They're still living in Germany. And, uh, I'm see he's seeing the bills. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, let me know if this is like, so how was your relationship with him at that time then? Or, oh, uh, he didn't like it, of course. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, who, who would like that, you know? Who would yeah, like Dan, that? Dan has two kids. Like, yeah. Dan, you probably wouldn't like, <laughs> well, your kids are a little bit young, too young to use credit cards right now, but yeah. um, uh, they're like f four and two, right, Dan? Or five and two, almost three. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> But yeah, can you can you talk about that a little bit? But I wonder, you know, if you tell them something not to do, but they do it anyway, but in the end they are happy about it, would you rather see them happy doing what they want to do going against you, or would you like them to be unhappy and listen to you? Oh, good point. Dan. I think it's a case-by-case <laughs> case basis, right? Um, yeah. If it's like they find their life's passion, their life yeah. goal yeah. you know yeah, yeah, thing yeah. that they really want to do then yeah. obviously i want them happy yeah. but if they're like just eating another the chocolate i'm flipping <laughs> out it's completely different right <laughs> of course <laughs> yeah right or they're they're like yeah okay it's all context i mean it's context yeah, yeah, it's yeah. context that's true yeah it's, yeah it's like if they find their life school i mean they know what this is you know, this is what they're going to do for the rest of their lives. Yeah. Uh, you know, I might want them to be a doctor or a musician or something like that. And they, they go, you know what? No, I just want to be a painter. And <laughs> if that makes them happy, then it makes yeah. them happy. Mm. Oh, they oh. But they have to own up to those choices, right? Yeah, because of course. Yeah. Obviously, painters, like, they're not going to make that much money unless, yeah. unless they make it big like David Cho. Yeah. <laughs> right. Or like they, they get stock instead of... Uh cash for yeah. good, for a right. good company and they gamble yeah. and they, yeah. oh, well that's yeah gambling is a whole yeah and <laughs> the gamble, well that's what david cho did he, he gambled he's like i'm a gambling person you know he was addicted to gambling so he goes i'll take stock options i don't care yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> um so okay so you're david in cho was tail, what's that way, tail. No, tail, uh, i was just wondering if tail knows who david cho is oh uh, no i didn't he's a korean american artist uh, oh, okay yeah uh yeah he what he did was he he painted the mural for Facebook, the hallway in our opening lobby or something like that. Mm -hmm. And instead of paying them in cash or mm -hmm. paying him in cash, they go, "We'll give you stock options." So when Facebook went public, he was worth three hundred million dollars. Wow! Yeah. Up yeah. until then, he was really dirt poor. Oh, I see. Well, then he got arrested. Mm -hmm. Well, he wasn't rich, but he was like just getting by. Yeah. And, yeah. and yeah, so, he yeah. almost got arrested in Japan. He got he did get arrested in Japan. He did. Yeah, yeah. Six months in jail. Yeah. Oh, I see. But uh, he always says that that's some of the best paintings he ever did <laughs> in jail. Yeah, <laughs> with, soy with soy sauce and, and shit. Yeah. Um, wait, wait, wasn't he also on a on a, on a I think on a, on a Vice video? Yeah, I think he's I've a, seen him on Vice. Yeah, he's very close Vice, to the Vice guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
He does a yeah. thumbs up. Yeah, yeah. I do know about him. I oh. forgot his name, <laughs> but I do know about him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So okay. Um, yeah. What, what, so did your dad cut? Because he can cancel the credit card if he wanted to, right? Yeah, but I mean, I would find out one way or the other, and then I figured, you know, I would just do whatever it takes to stay there and live there and do what you know, jobs, whatever, mm. you know. <laughs> yeah. I so know. I was like, yeah, support me until you can or want to support me, and you know, after that, we'll see where we stand. Wow. Yeah. And you are the oldest in your family, or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, only son, oldest. Uh, yeah. I have a younger sister. Oh. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, I know, like, yeah, because you're the only son. So then, okay. Uh, do you feel any like? So, do they put a lot of like pressure on you to like carry the family name or like? So you're here. You're do, you're in New York. Okay. So mm-hmm. you're in New York now. Mm-hmm. You're acting, mm-hmm. and um. So you now you're maxed out your dad's credit card. What mm-hmm. kind of how? What do you do to survive? I guess and. Well, um, apparently he wanted to keep supporting me. Oh wow! Yeah, so I got lucky, yeah. at least uh, until two thousand four. <laughs> two thousand. So okay, it's two thousand. Two years. Okay, two years. Yeah, okay. two years. Yeah, so two and a half actually until the summer of two thousand four. Because you could tell that I was that serious about it. Oh, good. Yeah, I mean, I even used my food money to, and sometimes even my rent, which was really stupid. Because, you know, during my studies, I was at some point like three months homeless. But anyway, I used all my money wow. for the resources that I could get into my hands. Like, I, it was like pre-Netflix. Pre-Netflix, not the online web stream yeah. Netflix, yeah. but the Netflix where they like sent you the D- DVDs, DVDs at home. <laughs> I still so, like yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so I bought a, like like a shitload of... Can I curse? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. You like, can like, totally like, fucking like, curse, yeah. <laughs> like a shitload of yeah. DVDs and um, I went to watch plays, you know. I would like go to... What was it Pace University? Like at... at, at seven in the morning to get in line for um the irresistible rise of arturo Ui to watch um al pacino on stage oh wow with one of the cancellation tickets for like 10 bucks you know okay yeah and those kind of things yeah the standby tickets or you know and i would make it a habit to watch at least two films before i go to sleep every day during those two years so which wow. sums it up you know i have like a fair good repertoire of, of a lot of films, films yeah. in my head. You know, it was all for acting. So, yeah, I sacrificed everything. Mm. I, I I went homeless at some point. At some point, I didn't have enough money for food. So I stole my food. Wow! <laughs> all that wow. stuff. You know? But uh, whatever, I was, I was young. I mean, it's, it's like 16 years ago. So, okay. yeah, 15 years ago. Wow. Yeah, and um, anyway... Um, 2004 came around. I was at Strasbourg for two and a half years. Um, in 2004, I took um, so the last six months at Strasbourg, I took it um, part time, uh-huh. and um, during the other time, I I could spend some money on on taking acting classes in Meisner. So I took some private classes in Meisner, and. Um, with Ro- Ro- uh, Robert X. Modica. I don't know for the people out there who are interested in that stuff. Shout out to Robert. Yeah, Robert X. <laughs> Modica, who is, um, uh, who is, uh, what's the guy's name? Oh, God. I mean, the reason why I took the, this teacher was, um, oh, my God, he was in The Big Lebowski, the Italian guy. Oh, man. Oh, uh, uh, Stanley Tucci. No. No, no. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, holy shit. Well, we can... We name can another go- movie he's in. If you uh, name another movie, I can do it. Oh, really? Joe Pesci? No. No, no, no. Um, damn De Niro. It. Well, uh, I don't know. Oh my I was not a big fan of the He was, he was in, a, in a few films of the Coen brothers. You, uh, wait, you don't like The Big Lebowski, Dan? Oh, John Turturro. Oh, John Turturro, Turturro exactly. Oh, it has okay. To be John Turturro. Yeah, John Turturro, exactly. Okay. Oh my God, thank you. Oh, shame on me. I forgot his name. It's all good. Anyway, yeah, so because of John Turturro, um, I looked up his acting teacher, who was um, Robert Modica. So some private classes with him. And then I looked up um, where Philip Seymour Hoffman came oh. from. And then I stumbled upon Stella Adler. So I went to Stella Adler, um, Stella Adler Studio of Acting in New York. And I took private cl- uh, part-time classes there, um, which for the Strasbourg... 
<laughs> group is kind of like, you know, oh my god, it's blasphemy. Oh, you know? <laughs> hard time, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So you cannot take like any other techniques because for them it's a doctrine and then it becomes like the, the gospel truth. You know? Oh, Stella Adler. Yeah, right, yeah, 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 for Strasbourg, for Strasbourgians, I mean. Anyway, so oh, I took... Strasbourg, yeah. Yeah, so I just wanted to get the whole gist of American techniques that are out there and that were famous at the time. And um, by the summer of 2004, I realized, okay, I got enough of this emotional American stuff. <laughs> so I need some classical training. So where, where do I go? Okay, I look up again, like the best school and the best city um, that the world has to offer, which was the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts in London. And um, they had an intensive class for Shakespeare. And um, one of the teachers in my, at uh, Stella Adler happened to be the person who auditions um, the people for the Royal Academy on the American side. Oh, cool. So I asked him, okay, what, what should I do? You know me as a student and you know where I'm, where I'm at. And he was like, you know, you should take this um, Shakespeare intensive class. And I was like, okay, I'm going to audition for it, but I'm not going to audition for you. I just want to do it on my own, fucker, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, like yeah, I had yeah. a lot of pride. <laughs> so I, I did a taped audition and I sent it in. And then a few weeks later, I found out that um, I was on their waiting list. Oh, you went out? Nice. Yeah, so when I, when I got onto the waiting list, I made sure that I called the office every day from New York to London that they know that there's this crazy guy out here that wants to get into that class. Wow. Just in case someone cancels. So I called them every day. Um, I think it was uh, for London time around 10 a.m. So every day until I, until I got the letter and that I got accepted. And then I got accepted. Oh, wow. So you had to wake up at 7 a.m.? Oh, no, what time? I don't remember yeah. what it no, was. No, it's yeah. nighttime. Yeah, oh, I called okay. them. Been nighttime. I called them every day, yeah. Wow, cool, okay. And then, and then I got the letter that I got in. And then um, I spent the summer acting Shakespeare Intensive at RADA. And then I went back to Germany after that, after those two and a half years. And I, and I started um, writing my own stuff. And, um, you know, and I, I spent about six months or nine months. I, don't, I, I can't remember exactly, but, you know, around, not a full year, though. I, I spent in Germany. I, I performed a play in Berlin, a one-man show that I've written. Oh, wow. Cool. Yeah. And then I went back to New York. Okay. Yeah. So, and this is basically when I became like a working actor, right out of school, doing my own stuff, and then back to New York, mm -hmm. auditioning, yeah. doing like, you know, indie films and short films. Um, yeah. So that was uh, since 2005. So I've, I've been acting... For twelve years. Okay, so the 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 journey of to New York, <coughs> mm -hmm. uh, to London, yeah, then back to Germany for a bit, yeah, and then back to New York, yeah. So that whole how long is that right there? I guess back to New. Uh, so when I was back in New York, it was I think. It was in the beginning of two thousand six. Okay, yeah. so 2002 to 2006 is yeah, that kind yeah. of journey. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. so that's kind of like your your college or your graduate school. Or <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I can say that. I mean, back then when I went back to Germany after Shakespeare, I was so inspired that I started writing like poetry, and um, but it was also a time when I was um, diving into the history of stand-up comedy. So I, uh, <laughs> I, 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 um, yeah, American stand-up. So yes, I, yeah. I read a lot on Lenny Bruce and Richard Pryor, Richard Pryor, and, yeah, Richard Pryor Eddie Murphy, Whoopi Goldberg's, um, Whoopi Goldberg on Broadway and back to Broadway. That was amazing. Mm. Um, yeah, so I got inspired so much by that, that I wanted to write something where I can play, um, like a version of myself w within different characters on stage as a one-man thing. Mm. So I did that, and I did my own version in Germany then. Okay. Yeah. So that was in German. Yeah, that right? was in German. Cool. Yeah, and um, then You still I, do that show once in a while, or not really? No, nah, I did it just <laughs> that one week. It was also like a very unique opportunity to, to do it anyway. Yeah. Yeah. It was um, so, uh, like a cultural kind of thing for, for Asian for Asians, you know, to put like... 
like an ensemble on which um, involved arts some some uh, graffiti some acting mm. you know that kind of thing yeah well, that's cool uh, I'm I'm a little curious about like Dan sorry do you have any questions or no no go right ahead I was just I was curious about um, so growing up in Germany from so your parents are Korean immigrants to Germany yeah yeah and uh, so they are they from the north, uh, like Seoul area, or are they from like Pusan area, or like? Uh... So uh, my father's side, uh, my grandparents, they both come from North Korea. Oh wow! Um, and uh, my mother's side, uh, on my mother's side, my grandfather um, is from Jeju-do, which is like the southernmost island of Korea. Okay. And my mother's side is, has also North Korean roots. Like my, my grandmother on my mother's side has oh. also North Korean roots. So, okay. Which is not very uncommon, you know, in that right. generation. You know, because back then there was no South and North, North Korea. Yeah. Yeah, they were just like from, from, from some northern area, you know. Oh, wow. <laughs> but anyway, so, um, yeah. And uh, my parents, they immigrated to Germany I think it was around 76 1976 because back then in the 60s and the 70s um, post-war Germany invited a lot of foreign like cheap foreign guest workers okay yeah and the um, same as US yeah 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 and the, the bigger bunch were Turkish people and um, I think Turkish and um, uh, I can't remember what the other eth ethnicity was, but Koreans were one of those. Okay. Especially because Koreans, uh, Korean men were physically smaller and they needed people who work in there uh, as blue collar workers in like oh. mining facilities oh, okay. in the 70s. So um, yeah, my dad was one of those. And he was the a mother, minor. yeah, he was a minor. And, oh, wow. And, and my mother, all the, all the Korean females, they, they were nurses. Okay. Because for some reason, like Germany was short on nurses back then, mm. yeah, so they needed them. Um, yeah, and after mining closed down and they didn't need like that many nurses anymore, you know, um, all my friends' parents and my parents, you know, they they just settled down and they opened up like Korean restaurants or some fast <laughs> food restaurants or delis or you know whatnot, like similar nice. to what like parallels to what you see what happened in the United States. Okay. Only the cultural movement wasn't as free but more something out of necessity. Mm. You know? Yeah. Not out to of survive. like yeah, not out of, you know, free will and, you know, and an American dream, but more <laughs> about, you know, surviving and because it's tough in Korea and the government had this deal with Germany or whatever, the Korean government. Mm. Yeah. So then so you grew up uh, so your you and your sister grew up um in that so in that environment like did you guys have to so your dad was minor nurse and then did you also have to help out the shop when he opened up the restaurant or the shops or no oh uh, yeah i helped when i was after i became 12 years old i think like yeah for a solid 3 4 years i helped my father a lot in his restaurant oh, okay yeah that seems to be a trend, uh, especially for Asian immigrants, like in uh, around the world. I guess they have to help the parents, and then um... yeah, <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Now, did you? Um... <sighs> okay, did you pay your dad back, or? <laughs> oh, if I pay... no, I never paid him back. Oh wow! Yeah. Uh, is there any sense of sorry? This is my personal. Is there yeah. any sense? Coming from such a working class background, yeah, because my my parents are also working class. My dad yeah. was an engineer. My dad was a little bit more um, intellectual side. He had a degree, so he's part of the the brain drain of yeah. Taiwan yeah. during the Cold War. Yeah, um, and my but my mom worked in the post office, and my yeah. dad was laid off after they didn't you know contract work yeah. was over for defense. Um, so my mom worked in the post office, and mm -hmm. I know for me growing up as you know doing you know. Yeah. Work, producing writing yeah. directing there is a sense of uh, it's taken me years to kind of like peel it back but a sense of guilt yeah like oh i get to pursue my dreams yeah. sure yeah and my parents did not yeah 
Um, do you do you ever feel that or no? Uh, no, I never felt that. Oh, interesting. And, um, okay. I was thinking about that too, um, in comparison to how Koreans Koreans are and how Korean Americans are. Okay. Because German Koreans or ger people who immigrants or people who grew up in in the European environment um, have a have a sense. No, don't have a sense of privilege, oh, but, okay. you know, work because they grew up in that privileged environment. So what I'm saying is, Germany has a very um, well-knit social system, a social support system. So if you're homeless, you get a home from the, from the state, from the oh. country. If, you're, if you don't work, you get money um, from the state until you find work. Of course, they give you a deadline, but they calculate ca calculate a deadline for you. Um, depending on your education, how long it will take you, considering the current market situation and economy, mm -hmm. how long it will take you until you get a job and the, the state takes care of you. Oh, so wow. the taxpayers' money actually goes back to the people, which gives you the luxury of um, always feeling secure, of always feeling safe. Right? In whatever industry you choose. In whatever you, okay. you choose in Germany. Yeah. So since I never had to worry about money, mm -hmm. I never had the issue of um, thinking about how I'm going to take care of my parents, you know, okay. or, how, or how am I going to pay them back. And on top of that, my um, financial education um, that came from my parents was very <laughs> poor because they didn't know how to handle money and how to talk about it. Oh. So my sense right now at this moment is not that of guilt and then maybe I have to pay him back but just I have to pay him back because I don't you know I feel like I feel grateful she yeah, grateful, yeah. yeah just you know very just simple it's just as simple as that I mean it took me a long time to get come to that conclusion mm. because before that before maybe three four years back I didn't have the sense of I, I owe him something you know uh, yeah. yeah it's like they put me onto this world they better take care of this shit you know <laughs> <laughs> it's true though yeah it's true as a parent yeah. that i feel that way yeah wait, so, yeah. So, wait dan can you articulate what you what you feel i mean it's exactly what Teo just said i mean I, it was my my choice to bring my kids into the world so i have to like make sure that they're set up for success hmm. i'm not gonna view them as like my social welfare <laughs> they're not my social security hmm. It's, uh, yeah, it's, so, it's some parents do that, which is unfortunate. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. this is where the Asian immigration thing comes in because mm. it correlates with um, having more children for financial security in their elderly age. You know, yes, yeah. you know that kind of thing. But in Germany, we don't have that as much. So um, that's a cool system, though. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a very fortunate and a very privileged system that mm. that I get to that I got to experience because it gave me also the luxury of um, of um, having the time and no pressure to think about art and what it all means and I mean th I think yeah. that, that that's the whole reason why why the art world in Germany and the philosophy world you know it's so strong I mean mm. because they have the luxury of being able to have the time to spend a lot of resources and and thinking into that that leisure which is called art you know yeah yeah it's like you know the maslow hierarchy no um, i don't so maslow hierarchy is basically your base it's a pyramid of needs right mm -hmm. you need basic survival needs mm -hmm. food shelter water mm -hmm. and then but above that is when you start talking about you know arts mm -hmm. love passion mm -hmm. um but yeah it sounds like yeah so once once you're, you know, either your government or yeah. your family helps you take care of those basic yeah. needs, then, yeah. Yeah. What What does it all mean? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, look at it. Yeah, even, even, even the I think uh, the program directors and the and the curators at at MoMA in New York and PS One, they're both German. Oh. Know? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, that speaks for itself. Hmm. But I'm maybe just pulling something yeah. out of my I don't know. <laughs> German Are you a German national still? No, I'm Korean. Oh, what? But I mean, like, your passport and everything? Yeah, I'm fully Korean. Oh. oh. Wait. You didn't, you... I never I never adapted my German citizenship, no. Uh, huh. That yeah, was because I, I didn't care and I was too dumb to even care. To get uh. to tell you the, the honest truth. Because when I was 18... 
Um, uh-huh. In Germany, they give you um, the choice of becoming Korean or German citizen if your parents uh-huh. didn't just make you a German citizen and um, by birth. And uh, my parents wanted to give me that choice, but I was just too dumb to care. Yeah. Huh. Because, you know, I wasn't aware of social issues or, you know, of my opportunities. I just did whatever I want. And, um, and just later then in my life, when I decided to come to Korea, um, I had to be faced with that issue because I would have to give up my, not my citizenship, but my permanent residency for German, for, for Germany. Oh, so you have permanent residency. Yeah, okay, yeah, you have yeah, that yeah. thing. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah, that's interesting. Because my cousins are, they were, all three of them were born in Germany, in Hamburg. Yeah. And I think they still have dual citizenship. Yeah. From yeah. U.S. and Germany or? U.S. and Germany. Oh, okay. Because yeah. Yeah. I, so, but then growing up in Germany, like, did you and your sister face any racism or any identity issues uh, growing up there? Because um, I, I like, cannot talk know. for my sister because we are nine years apart, so she grew up in the 90s. Okay. I grew up in the 80s and I definitely had race, race issues. Oh, damn. Yeah. Um. I mean, 80s Germany was when Germany was still split into um, East and West before the wall came down. And right around the time when the wall came down in 88, 89, yeah, we had a lot of East German skinheads. We had um, a lot of, um, like, neo-Nazis, a lot of gangs, um, Turkish gangs going going against Germans and German gangs going against everyone. Um, (sighs) Yeah, so, um, yeah, it was, it was a time when, yeah, you were, I was kind of on the edge, on my toes, looking around. I mean, it all became better after 95, but before mm-hmm. that, it was, yeah. What uh, happened in 95 that made it change? Um, I guess, uh... Was it the euro? Education one... and, and awareness general. No, the euro came in after 2000. After 99, oh. I think it was, yeah. <clears throat> but, um, hmm. or was it maybe even earlier? I can't really remember. It's so, so, such a long time ago now. But, um, yeah, for some reason, after 95, it became better. I mean, maybe it was just me coming out of puberty. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, but I didn't get. Um, I hacked on or bullied on or beat up on as much as I used to. Oh, so uh, you got into a bunch of fights or... Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the whole reason for me becoming an athlete was because I was on the streets playing basketball. I would, like, play street ball all the time. Mm. Um, yeah, and that was definitely an environment where you had to... If you don't excel good in sports, you know, yeah. as a foreigner, yeah. then, then you get really picked on. <laughs> oh, shoot. Okay. <laughs> so you can take care of yourself in a fight, I guess. or, uh, or you, I don't you... know if I could anymore. Yeah. But, <laughs> and back then, uh, back then, I got more beaten up than really, you know, beat up, yeah, beat up someone else. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. I, I didn't enjoy fighting. Yeah, it's it, it can get dangerous. Um, yeah. Um, I, like so, be, now do you still have a, um, I guess do you still have a very strong connection with Germany then? I mean that's your your childhood, yeah. Or, or are you growing more affinity towards uh, Korea now that this is your new home? I guess, or it's kind of like they're both your home. It's like yeah, there's no, it's like it's like both your parents, right? You can't say you you know. Right. Well, it's really hard to say because growing up the way I did, there's always the issue of identity and what I do identify with. Sure. Yeah. So in that sense, I would say I'm more kind of a citizen of the world. Yes. Um, uh, yeah. And I don't look back that much anymore. Hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm very appreciative of the education and of the opportunities and the not opportunities that ha- have been given that has been given me in Germany because it made me the person that I am today you know? yeah, yeah. so um, yeah so yeah, I guess I'm just grateful but I don't have any like stronger emotional connection to the past I mean I'm I think I have a stronger connection now to Korea because I don't feel like I want to move away yeah I okay. feel like I want to keep living here mm. um, even though 
a lot of my after the um, soul searching Sunday experience where we met um, a lot of my American friends tell me and my agent tells me that I should go to the United States for better opportunities but I don't feel that way so I tend to disagree okay yeah because as a Korean fluent in Korean but also fluent in English over here in Korea, I realized I get much more unique opportunities that I wouldn't get when I'm only in the United States. Mm. You know, because the market of the United States is, um, believe it or not, just, I believe, a little limited to the United States. Oh, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if I think about what happened to my career after Sundance, yeah. um, I worked on a Vietnamese production. The Bitcoin heist, right? Yeah, or, Bitcoin yeah. heist yeah. with with uh, a local production company with locals. That's cool. Um, I I worked on a uh, on a Thai production, a local Thai production mm. with a Thai director with with locals, and um, it was all because they were looking for a Korean actor who was able to speak English, and they couldn't reach out all the way to the United States, ah. and they couldn't afford it. You know, mm -hmm. I'm still not famous enough. So I'm cheap, you know, that okay. kind of thing. can afford me. And I'm, and I'm willing to go the extra mile to make that experience for now in my career because I feel like uh, I can, I, I cherish the experience more than the paycheck at the moment. Mm, that's a good, uh, um, yeah. And that's a very deliberate des decision by me because mm. I could do, if I would consider money more, I would probably go to the United States. You know? Really? Okay. Yeah, because you're protected by the union. And it's a better, it's a, even if you're not, if you, even if you're not union, you get a better paycheck mm. than what you can make in, in Southeast Asia or right, Korea right. or Russia or whatnot. You know? I just came back from a job in, in Russia right, working right. with locals on a very local subject. And um, I know for a fact that there's no other actor like me out there who made these experiences in the past two years. I went to Bali with a local production, you yeah. know. It's, um, yeah, so it's been crazy after Sundance. It's been very interesting. <laughs> and I feel like I'm slowly building a career where before I had role models where I want to be like somebody. Um, but now it's not that case anymore. Now, especially after post, the post internet Facebook age, there, there, are, there are things that don't happen like the way they used to anymore. Mm. And I'm in the middle of that at the moment, so I feel I feel really grateful for that. I think something that I connected with is like choosing the experience over the money. Right? Yeah, yeah, because then like yeah, you get to live in Thai, live and work in Thailand, work, live and work in in Vietnam. Yeah, and then uh, you're just coming back from Mas Moscow, where you're you're you are. Did you want to talk about that project at all, or? Um, you're playing. A, I cannot. Uh, I cannot go too much into detail, but yeah. for. Um, the listeners, um, <laughs> if you if you look up the name Kirill Serebrennikov, our director, and if you look up the name Viktor Tsoi, who's the guy I played, then that should be enough um, information for the nerd researcher out there <laughs> to, to spend the night on. <laughs> I'll, I'll spell that out in the text below, um, but yeah, yeah. Cool, thanks. And how did I have a few questions now? Yeah. So how long have you been in, in Korea? Okay, so I stayed in New York until after going back. Yeah, after two thousand six, I stayed in New York until two thousand nine. So I usually say I was off and on in New York for um, six to seven years. Mm. Um, then I came back to Korea in two thousand nine. Well, well, what am I saying? Not back. I mean, I moved to Korea for the first time, actually. That's crazy, because yeah. you grew up in Germany, and yeah. then, so you went back to... I'm assuming you stopped by in Germany to say goodbye to your... you know, get your stuff, I guess? Or did you go directly from New York to Korea? I did go directly. Wow. Yeah. Oh, shit. Okay. Because yeah. you've already... you know, you've established your life already in New York by that yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you had all your, I guess... You don't you don't have you don't have that much stuff I'm guessing right or uh, yeah not that much okay I'm not so so, so much attached to like things yeah you know, my things okay so you just moved to uh, directly okay cool yeah. and then do your your yeah sorry go ahead Dan 
And then how do you audition for things that are outside of Korea? I mean, the Thailand production, the Bali production, the yeah. Vietnam production, and the Russia production. I mean, do they have like local agents looking for a Korean actor who can speak English and Korean? Um, all of those jobs, um, ever, since, uh, ever since 2015, after Sundance, um, came, landed um, in my lab through different lines. So there was never one agent, there was never one story. There were, all of these jobs came to me very uniquely. <laughs> it, it, some, it's like for example, the Bali production was um, a package deal with an actor who was more famous right. than I, no problem, who was more famous than I was, and he happened to be in my management company at the time. Yeah. And, um, so I met with the director who already cast the f more famous guy. And since um, I was in, in the same company, I was like, okay, I, I take a look at the, at the people who, who are potentially the actors who can play like the, like the part filling um, <laughs> um, um, supporting roles, you know, mm. that kind of thing. So that was the Bali thing. Um, Thailand. Um, a friend of mine recommended me to to his ex-girlfriend and the ex-girlfriend was contacted by an agent in in thailand so the thai person <laughs> to to backtrack the thai person the the, the thai agent yeah. contacted a girl in korea the the girl in korea who was a model had an ex-boyfriend and the ex-boyfriend was is a filmmaker um who i knew re like kind of um sporadically who contacted me and was like, hey, he might fit the bill, you know, he's not too expensive, he has these kind of looks, he speaks fluent English, and um, he could represent the Korean character in your film. So, mm. yeah, I put myself on tape, I, um, and then next thing I knew was I was on, on board. Which uh, production is this? Do you want, you want to mention it? Or? Uh, yeah, it's called Talent One. The film is called The Moment. And uh, it was kind of like a Thai version of Love Actually. It's a omnibus style, episodic um, film of three stories. Um, one in Seoul, uh, one couple in New York, and one couple in London. Oh. And um, I played the Seoul part. And um, my counter, my like romantic counterpart was a guy, so it was my first gay role too. And um, we opened up number one on Valentine's Day last year. Oh. Yeah, so that was an interesting experience. <laughs> yeah, so that was my Thai experience. Uh, my yeah. first gay kiss. Um, oh, wow. Number one at the bo box office. <laughs> number and, one gay kiss. Yeah. 2016. Uh, yeah, yeah, 16. And, you know, and like a small fan base. Um, the Vietnamese production, how did that come by? Um, the Bitcoin one, right? Yeah, but, yeah Bitcoin yeah. heist. Yeah. Oh, okay. I remember now the the film Soul Searching, which uh, played at Sundance uh, 2015. Benson Lee, yeah, not Benson Kim, Lee. but <laughs> Lee played at um, Campfest, and at Campfest the producer saw me and the director saw me, and then um, from what I heard is they had someone else in mind who was older, but he couldn't do it, so I was next in line. They contacted me. I got on board and. Um, yeah, it's you're the, like a main role in that too, because like on the poster, you're like the the biggest he head in the poster, I think. Yeah, <laughs> I mean it just looks like that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean I'm on, I'm an honest stra straight shooter, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As you might have realized by now, but um, yeah, I'm a solid supporting role. Oh, okay, I'm like okay. the um, Andy Garcia character in uh, Ocean's Eleven. Okay. You know, I'm the guy they try to rob. Ah. You know, the rich Korean guy. You're the rich guy Korean guy, okay. Who's like, Thai, who has like ties to like, to like gangsters and who's also a hacker and has like a lot of Bitcoin money. Okay. And they try to steal it from me. Dude, <laughs> I'm looking at that cryptocurrency. I don't know if you're into investing, but that shit is, is, is kind of interesting. Yeah, it's, it's a gamble. It's, it's a gamble. It's but, interesting, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, go, I, you know what, it's one thing that you brought up, um, watching all these films, yeah. what about your own, so you've been working with all these different directors, yeah. what about your own personal artistic vision or tastes? Yeah. Like, what were, what are some of the, I know I have some key films for me that when I saw in high school, like, whoa, I didn't know you could do that, that's great, like, uh, Edward Yang with E.E. E. or, uh, 
Ho Shao Shen with um, Dust in the Wind, mm -hmm. um, Taiwanese filmmakers. Um, mm -hmm. What were some of the films that really spoke to you when you started, uh, when you were doing those those formative artistic years? Um, I would say three filmmakers were um, the ones that really influenced me. Um, in my purity in Germany, it was Wong Kar Wai because I didn't mm. know that there was someone who could use the 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 grammar of film to convey melancholy so well yeah and i and i didn't feel as alone anymore in in europe as i as i used to um then during my new york years i would say uh michael haneke who did um, the white ribbon amour and um also what was the other film uh cache i don't know the the english title okay um yeah, Michael Haneke is definitely one of the big ones. And now, just like recently, I would say, um, I would say, uh, Tsai Ming Liang. Oh. Yeah, Tsai Ming Liang is, is really someone who influenced me. Also Ang Lee, mm. both Thai Taiwanese. Um, right? Is Ang Lee Taiwanese? Uh, Ang Lee is Taiwanese. He's, he grew up in, uh, I think, Pingdong or Taitong. Yeah, yeah, yeah he is. Uh, right, but yeah. Tsai Ming Liang is Malaysian, but his career is in Taiwan. Right, yeah, he's yeah. Malaysian and his yeah. career is in Taiwan. And that was also one of the reasons because I think one to go to come back to your question is one thing that really was um, food for my soul, <laughs> emotional food for my soul, Yeah, was... Um, the feeling of displacement and therefore being always very melancholic. Oh. And a day with melancholia melancholia used to be like a good day because it tend to be like very depressive in my life. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> but I fought that off very well by now. And um, so yeah, so melancholy because of that displacement and because of having no sense of identity and not knowing where to go and where 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 I'm from. Um used to be like a big struggle and a big kind of search for who I am oh. as a person. And um, yeah, all those filmmakers deal with that kind of thing. And yeah. especially in the later days now, Tsai Ming Liang. But um, also researching about Tsai Ming Liang and then thinking about um, your background, the Taiwanese background, yeah. you know, they, I feel like the cultural DNA of Taiwanese people has it naturally embedded in them to understand melancholy more than other Asian cultures because of their displacement from post-war China mm. and how they fled over to Taiwan. Yeah. And um, having a sense of wanting to return back but having to adapt the island as their new home. Yeah, yeah. You know? So I found that always very, very beautiful. Also Edward Yang, of course, he's yeah. also one of those. But um, yeah, so I mean Yang. Um, and recently I would say... I would say the director that I just worked with, Kirill Serebrennikov. I mean, mm. he hit me like really strongly, like figuratively, like uh, yeah, above my head. <laughs> he physically yeah. did not hit you, but he, yeah. I think you mentioned about displacement. Yeah, I guess the yeah, Taiwanese identity. It's interesting because there is that group that came from from China. And there's mm. also the group that is in Taiwan yeah. as well, and it's just like this interaction of identity and. I, I also feel that in America, I, I, it's a different circumstance, of course, yeah. but like ta <laughs> no, Taiwanese or American. And um, now here in Korea, like they, ac they accept you as Korean or um, I mean, how was it adjusting? I guess we can talk about that, that transition period. Well, um, Oh, that's that's a loaded question. <laughs> but to give you a, but to give you a simple answer, no, they don't accept me as Korean. Oh but wow! But then again, um, wherever I am, the uh, the local people will never accept me as one of their own. Like the Germans will never accept me as a, like a German. Oh, shit. The people in the states will never accept me as a like United States citizen, and that's okay. I mean, it puts me on a very unique edge. Yeah, I'm okay yeah. with that. And in Korea, it's the same thing. So. Um, so in terms of that, another way of answering that question is, um, I can make everyone accept me as Teo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so I'm just I'm just me. I don't know. Like there's no nationality type of stigma attached to me. That's mm. how I feel now. Like I'm just a citizen of the world, 
and yeah yeah that's how i that's how i feel yeah i mean bruce lee he mentioned they asked him oh are you chinese or like what and he's like i'm a human being right yeah 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 because he was born in san francisco and you know um dan did you did you have anything to add or and I think it's a very common feeling probably for like Asian Americans as well, because I grew up in the 80s yeah. you know, in in San Diego, which was very white. And then the only other Asians that were around were like Vietnamese immigrants, our first generation who barely spoke English. Yeah. So then how, how old are you, if you don't mind me asking? I'm 44. 44, okay. You wow, you look yeah. much younger. <laughs> I was like, Asian I thought surprise. because you were you were saying you know you grew, grew up in the eighties in San Diego. I was like, wait, are we the same age? You know, yeah. <laughs> I'm older. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. you're mid thirties sure. now, Teo. Or you I'm, I'm thirty six. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm the youngest here, thirty three. So yeah. Mm-hmm. And sorry, Dan, what, what, what were you gonna say? Oh no, it's just I think it's a very similar kind of feeling mm-hmm. because in the eighties in San Diego it was very very white. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you're definitely if I, I went back to China mm-hmm. in 84 to go visit and we stuck out like a sore thumb me and my cousins because we dressed differently everyone could see us mm-hmm. yeah you know, we walked down the street and they go oh yeah those people are not Chinese mm-hmm. they might look kind of like Chinese yeah. but they're not Chinese. yeah I, I don't know if this is the same for you Taylor like I speak Chinese I speak uh, Mandarin with a very thick American accent yeah <laughs> I mean, that's something you probably have to unlearn, right? To to be able to act in Korea. In Korea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm still. I'm I'm not really struggling with it anymore. Oh, I cool. used to because I had I had a thick accent too. But I work. I'm working. I'm still working on. Um, I'm getting speech classes oh, every cool. every week, and oh. um, yeah. But by now, people don't recognize uh, my accent anymore. Like oh. I don't have one anymore. Okay. Yeah, they uh, they realize that uh, I'm not from Korea via the content and my thought and my attitude. Ah. Uh, and not by uh. my speech. Right. Yeah. But when <laughs> they see you, they they can't tell. Yeah, they can't. They can't. Okay, your style now seems fairly Korean, I guess, or is this Korean No, it's style? not. No, this is, I don't know if this is Korean or not. This is just me. <laughs> this know? is you. Yeah, yeah, this is just me. And, um, but, um, like, and of course, you know, I dress for the occasion occasion or for the character when I go to a meeting or audition. Yeah. So they can't tell. But um Um yeah, if I talk to people they just say that that I'm very unique. So oh. you know, that's that's good enough. That's fair enough. <laughs> yeah. I think for, I guess I could work I, I I I'm conflicted about this issue because I can work on my I, I need to improve my Mandarin of course. Mm-hmm. But my accent, like, do I want to spend effort on reducing my accent or actually learning more, be more fluent in Mandarin? And mm-hmm. I'm focusing more on just being more fluent, right? Mm-hmm. Reading, writing. Um, because if you could, if everyone can understand me, mm-hmm. for the most, yeah, everyone can understand me. They just can tell I have a thick accent. So whatever, you know, so, you know, people in America have different accents in yeah, different parts yeah, of the States yeah. and no one says they're less American or yeah. whatever. Um, they do. Oh, these days. <laughs> oh, they do. Okay, whatever. Oh, okay. Screw that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, go I ahead. Do you have a question? Yeah. So the the, the productions that you ha- did in like Thailand and Bali uh-huh. and uh, Korea, mm-hmm. or not Korea, but Russia, yeah. were they in English? Did you have to, or were, did you like? I mean, you were a Korean um, character. They were like, always different. Um, for the production in Bali, I had to speak Korean. For Vietnam and Thailand, I spoke um, English. And for the one in Russia, I spoke Russian. I had to learn and memorize everything in Russian. Wow. Oh, shit. Shit. Because <laughs> you play a a Russian national. like a rock, a, Well, he's like a Russian icon. Viktor Tsoi? Yeah, yeah Viktor Tsoi, yeah. yeah. So I played, okay, for a little bit background information about that guy. Um, he passed away in 1990 in a very dubious uh, car accident. People think it was um, something else, mm. <laughs> so-called something else. And um, the reason for that is um, his rock music. He started in 81 with his first album and he had his last album out right before he died, working mm. on his next album. Um, his music influenced um, the Russian people so much so that they still to this day credit him for being one of the influences why the former... Soviet Union came down. Oh wow! Oh. So um, his music is is kind of like revolutionary. It 
screams freedom and um, and um, freedom of art, freedom of um, of of uh, oppression mm -hmm. and um, changes, and um, yeah, even to this day, when people go go out on the streets and demonstrate, they sing his songs. Wow, Victor Tsui. He He's is a, a Korean father, Russian uh, mother. mother yeah, yeah, yeah. So second generation uh, Korean Russian, and um, one of their cultural icons, so much that they would call him a saint. Wow. And um, yeah, so yeah, that was the role that I that I played, and I can only say this because the Russian media already published that. Okay, cool. Yeah, otherwise oh. I, I wouldn't be allowed. But yeah. you know. <laughs> is Toy a, a, a I I know I have a friend her yeah. last name is Toy she's in, from uh, one of the eastern uh from Uzbekistan or like close to Russia is yeah. that a common Korean Russian last name I guess or I don't know. Uh I don't think so. Yeah. It's just a common Korean name like Kim and Lee. Oh okay. Yeah, the Koreans say Choi. Oh. So that's the Korean pronunciation yeah, C H O I that's ah. the Korean pronunciation. And then it kind of went into Choi, and then later Tsoi, the way the um, Russians would pronounce it. Got and, it. Okay. Um, yeah. But they came there via, I think, natural uh, migration before North and South Korea were North and South. When uh -huh. Korea was one Korea and it was colonialized by the Japanese. Yeah. Well, even before that, I think the migration started in the 1860s yeah and it went all the way to 19 i think around 1910 1920 and um yeah and that's that that's that part of korean dna going into russian culture russian. yeah wow. um, just to check in how are you, are you okay on time if yeah i'm good on time yeah cool uh, are you yeah i'm good on time okay, yeah, cool. yeah, yeah yeah uh dan you good yeah. um one thing uh through all this, like, um, there is that, okay, loneliness, right? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, going through those periods of loneliness or, or the melancholy, mm -hmm. like, did you have a support system? Did you have, like, a girlfriend or a partner that you, that, <clears throat> or, like, that during those times of help, maybe, or? Uh, no, because um, even if I had, yeah, yeah. I mean, there were times where where I had um, partners, um, but though I would share it, it wasn't something where I could feel that it was um, either compassionate enough or culturally understandable enough for the other person to feel the way I feel, and therefore I would always feel lonely anyway. Uh. You know, because my situation was so unique. Yeah, I don't. I know many Korean Germans, yeah. but I don't know any Korean German who decided to become an actor. So I know <laughs> that I'm the only one. So yeah. that circumstance, that cultural circumstance paired with my ethnic circumstance and my cultural migration is very unique. It is, yeah. yeah. So if I would be in the United States with um, Korean Americans, I would feel very, very different. Mm. You know? And... Um, then coming to Korea and trying to, you know, make people understand all that, you know, I mean, how can I convey that kind of feeling of being German and understanding words like Zeitgeist or Gesundheit and therefore also understanding a little bit of Yiddish. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, knowing how to eat schnitzel with sauerkraut, but also know that Polish people eat sauerkraut and, mm. you know, being surrounded by, you know, TV where we had like um, channels that we could pick up from France, but also from, from the Netherlands and Belgium. Mm -hmm. And growing up with that kind of nostalgia, but then again going to the United States and then also understanding American culture because I have spent all of my 20s in, in, the, yeah. in, in the US. I mean, at least the bigger part of my 20s. And um, yeah, and then on top of that, being an actor and then coming to Korea and all of that, you know. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's um, my support system you were asking, right? To sure, come back sure. to the question. Um, when it would be too much that it's unbearable, I, I usually would just write. Okay. Yeah, so... That's your therapy, I guess. Yeah, that's my therapy, writing. Um, yeah. Because you write children's books too, yeah? Yeah. Or, or, or you well, how do you know that? I research. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, I'm a published children's book writer in Korea. Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, it started after uh, after Rada when uh, I I learned about the the techniques of how Shakespeare wrote his sonnets, and then I decided to write something not in um, pentameter but in septameter, if that makes any sense. So I wouldn't so make instead of ten syllables, you're doing. Yeah, I would do fourteen. Oh yeah. gosh! So okay. it with like something like in Korean in Hangul. In, in no in English. In English, okay, okay. So I just started practicing that, and then would go into also pentameter and um, see how that rhyme structure would um, affect storytelling in terms of pace, because if you set up a story with um, with uh, seven syllables and then break into five syllables, it becomes much faster pace, mm. right? And then I was thinking, okay, what is a universal story that I could talk about, which is easy for children to understand, mm -hmm. but um, sophisticated enough that ad adults would enjoy it too. Yeah. Which the rhyme structure already was for adults. But um, <clears throat> so I came up with um, the idea of why, like with the question why um, everyone in the world has always at some point one sock missing. Right, yeah, 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 like the left sock or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah one yeah. sock missing. So I came up with a story about like a little monster that uh, dwells in homes and eats one sock. <laughs> and um, then I backtracked that and I was like, okay, what are socks made of? And um, and then I came up with a story of, uh, with a coming of age story of a little, of a little um, extinct family of, of um, animals that are later called in the story monsters by the children. <laughs> Um, that live in a small hole in the ground somewhere in the southern parts of the United States in the cotton fields. Huh. And one day the parents disappear and the little protagonist, who, whom I call Teo, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Teo the Little Sock Monster, that's also the name of the book, um, Yeah, came out of his hole and um, realized, started realizing that his parents feed him, um, fed him the cotton of the cotton fields his entire... Um, uh, um, um, little life yeah. and then he started eating until he looked like a little cotton ball himself and he accidentally got picked up by one of the cotton pickers and um, lands in a big factory where the cotton is manufactured into um, texture material you know and he had to like ex cotton mill yeah. yeah yeah cotton mill escape the conveyor belt and then he land he arrives in a big city and you know, and there also like kicks in like the sense of loneliness and melancholy that I wanted the illustrator to convey. Mm. You know, and um, you wrote this in your late twenties or early. 30s? I wrote it in two thousand ten ish, I think. Okay. Eight, yeah, nine ish, ten ish. Yeah. And um, yeah, and then he arrives in the city, and then how he you know survives, and how he becomes <laughs> an adult, and how he lives like in a laundromat and he like eats it's like the like always like one sock and then the other he sleeps and you know that kind of thing right so it's so, autobiographical yeah yeah like yeah, the, yeah. Sens <laughs> the sensibility the emotional <laughs> sensibility of it was something that i tried to put in there also because i always hate the fact that children's books nowadays are tend to be always educational and uh -huh. i hate that because um, i grew up on a lot of audiobooks in the 80s in Germany. What what Germans love are audiobooks. Oh, cool. I love audiobooks. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But um, I used to listen to them as um, records. Oh. Yeah, so I would listen to Brother Grimm's stories. Mm -hmm. And they're not the, um, the cookie-cutter candy version of what um, Disney does with them. Oh, it's the originals. Yeah, the originals. Oh, they're wow. really Those, dark. They're and, super dark. Yeah, yeah, they're super dark. And... <sighs> You know, and but there is a sense of uh, learning the emotion of something which is weird or which is melancholic and lonely. I mean, even like Hans Christian Andersen's um, The Girl, The Matchstick Girl. It's a super dark, sad story. Mm. But there's some kind of beauty in it that you take away, you know, learning it when you're a child. Mm. Because, you know, you, you listen to that story like an old grandma's voice is, is telling you that story via like this recorder yeah. before you go to sleep. And you're like, oh you know and you fall asleep yeah. and you wake up and you kind of forget about it but you know but maybe you know 
there was some stories to it, you know that was so scary that I would cry but then the yeah. next day you would be like okay that was interesting yeah so I felt like you know in my story I wanted to convey that feeling of loneliness and melancholy which was very important for me and uh, mm. so uh, yeah writing I mean that's your therapy <laughs> yeah right now I'm writing music and 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 um, treatments for for future scripts so, oh great yeah so I'm, what, I'm graduating. <laughs> you're gra <laughs> what kind of um, music do you are you writing? Like rock music, pop music, or like uh, instrumental? Or well, I would say if you if you wanna put it into a category, I would say the closest would be world music. Okay. Because um, I try to use cheap instruments and record them and mix them up in my laptop by myself. Yeah. Um, for anyone who's interested out there, if you look up the word Teo Caravan with a K, you can find um, a few of my songs, all like early samples on, on SoundCloud. Oh, nice. Um, Check it out. <laughs> but, Teo um, Caravan with a K. It's very amateur level right now. Right now, I'm back from playing this guy, Victor Tsoi, and there's like enough reverberance left that I want to start writing a whole album oh wow so so I'm on my second song right now and then but it's all in Korean this time okay yeah the Teo Caravan stuff was like in English but now I'm all in Korean yeah but the, I only do that on the side you know yeah just, yeah that's your yeah and the reason why I do it in Korean is also because um, I, at the same time I want to I want to practice my 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 way of Korean expression oh yeah, okay you know yeah, so it it's it serves like two purposes. Uh, going back to your characters, mm -hmm. um, are you? Is it easy for you to shake off your character? Like, I guess getting into the character takes a lot of research and a lot of work. Yeah. Um, now, and you live in that space for however long the production is. I yeah. assume. Yeah. yeah. Now, do you? Is it hard going back to like, oh, Teo, citizen of the world, Teo, you? Yeah. Is is that is that a easy transition for you, or is it kind of hard, like moving in and out of productions? Uh, for me, it's always hard. Um, okay. Yeah, for me, it's always hard, and it also depends on the on the gravity and the the um, the intensiveness of the character. Sure, sure. But also on the paycheck. Yeah. <laughs> because. Uh, <laughs> yeah, being honest. Hey, yeah. hey, man. We're, yeah, because we're, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, if if they pay me so much for for a um, supporting role, and I got it like two weeks before we go into production, uh -huh. then there's only so much I can do yeah, in preparation, yeah. mm -hmm. and therefore I'm not as invested. That doesn't mean that I don't want to be. I still try my best, mm -hmm. but um, you know, for the pay grade of the amount my character is on screen, you know, I, I always do, but, you know, I always do more than, of course, what I'm getting paid. I always try to do more and I always try to be in, undisposable. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is that the right word? Uh, indisposable? In, in, indisposable, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I try to achieve on set, ultimately. But, um, you know, depending on the gravity of, 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 all those different circumstances, you know, it takes sometimes a bit longer, sometimes a bit shorter, but it's always hard. <laughs> uh, so you still have that reverberance of Victor in your body, I guess, or? I mean, yeah, because um, it was, I mean, the Victor Tsoi character was one of the hardest things that I've ever done in my life. Oh, shit. Because r the Russian language, I have so much respect for. <laughs> for that's something that you don't mess around with yeah yeah and um because i had to get it to a level where i'm being accepted as the person that they know as their saint oh god you know, think about that pressure that's so, a lot yeah yeah, yeah yeah so um it's like playing a mixture of kurt cobain morrissey and um and uh, and jim uh, morrison yeah yeah, yeah. <clears throat> it's like uh, I mean and Bob Dylan Bob Dylan I mean, yeah, yeah, like oh, a mixture shit. of that you know all, all those three the, four the, the people the fathers of yeah. their genres yeah, yeah so yeah, yeah. that's like how, how he is and um, so yeah I don't think that I'm going ever going to be able to to undo the memorizations that I did for all the songs and for the for the script that I went through the, this last summer wow yeah 
That's crazy. <laughs> it's always going to be like a part of me, I guess. So, yeah, yeah, but I guess fine. that's something you enjoy that you choose these experiences that become a part of you or of yeah, tail. Yeah. yeah this idea I- identity of tail, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I I welcomed the challenge. Ah. And um and when they offered it to me, I was like, man, okay, I knew about I knew about this person. Yeah. Um simply for the fact that I research who is an interesting Korean character in the history of the world that I might act one day. Like yeah. I did that research like 10 years ago. Oh, nice. So there are like a few interesting characters out there that still not many people know about. Mm. Victor Tsoi was one of them that, of course, the Russian people, and the, the Soviet, the former Soviet people know about. Yeah. But um, yeah, that was a big responsibility. So it was really tough. It was really hard. Mm. Yeah, it was very intense. But you, it seems like you you also took a lot from it. You're very that like, you're grateful for, yes, or yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned you did your research on all these um, Korean characters. Uh, is there a character that you would love to play uh, that from that research or yeah. in general? Yeah, yeah. There's one that I would love to play. Um, I don't know what the um, entertainable edge would be in a film or a TV series. Um, so there's this one Korean, his name is, his name on the internet is Antonio Korea, Korea with a C, Antonio Korea. And um, I stumbled upon him via a Rubens painting, the Dutch painter Ruben. Mm-hmm. He, he painted a Korean guy back in the day in the 1600s and nobody knows how this Korean guy got there or Rubens over here <laughs> so this is where you get to think okay how did he how did this famous Dutch painter painted a Korean guy and called it the Korean man the painting huh. you know so um, during the research I found out that um, I don't remember if it was um, the 17th or the 18th century, but anyway. Um, so, um, Jap- Japan, during like one of their um, um, reigns over Korea, sold uh, Korean slaves to, um, to, to uh, merchants that would come all the way to Korea via Japan, oh, wow. by traveling. Um, I don't know if it was over the Silk Road, you know, after, um, after, what was his name? Anyway, yeah, I don't know if it if it was over the Silk Road or via sea, but they came all the way to Japan, mm. and there was this one Italian guy, who mm. bought three slaves, three Korean slaves, and he kept the one that um, studied Latin and Italian the quickest. Huh. And that guy later was christened and named uh, Antonio Correa. He came all the way back to Italy um, and had his own family. And his, he adapted his nationality as his uh, last name. And there's still um, a, a line to him to about, um, I think it was like something like um, 300 families or something in a small village in Italy mm-hmm. that... Um, that know about this story because their own family, their last name is Korea. Oh shit! Yeah, with the C. To so, this day. Yeah, what? to this day. Wow. Yeah, so I had like different ideas about how I could pitch this story, combine it with something modern, and so, like like a treasure hunt, and you know someone goes <laughs> back and tries to look, you know, for something that the original uh, Antonio Korea kind of buried, or I don't know, like you know, yeah, okay. something like that. But um, yeah, that was an interesting story. It would, right. it would be like an interesting um, period piece. But, you know, who would invest in something like that? You're like coming back to the reality of the business, you know? So. Italian market, maybe? Yeah, or maybe. Korean market? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, who would be, then you would have to think who would be the market, you know? Who would be the, the audience mm. to sell it to? So there's no money in it. So it needs to be an independent art house film. Yeah, okay. And if that's the case, then who, which director would be invested enough to make such a story? 
So I realized, you know, maybe like an interesting pitch would be um, making it about food, you know, okay. <laughs> something like that, because Italians and Koreans love food very much alike. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know, like, so I'm just, you know, that was one guy that I would love to play. Another one, um, his name is e Lee Mirok, Lee Mirok, and, um, he fled Korea during the um, reign, during the Japanese reign, um, right after the First World War. Um, and he fled, somehow he ended up in Germany. Oh, okay. Yeah. You're the around. reason why he had to fl flee, why he flew the country, Korea, was because he was a, a resistance fighter against the Japanese. Mm. And what he ended up doing in Germany is he was a resi resistance fighter against the Nazis, too. <laughs> So he kind of became famous in a small village in, in that locality of the Germans. He's still buried there in Germany um, because he wrote um, about his independence from Japan in German for, mm. the, for the Jewish people and the Germans who were not Nazis but bystanders mm. to read. So that's how he protested and um yeah he was one of the guys who, who was very interesting too like an intellectual korean who was a revolutionary i guess at the time have you thought about writing and directing or just writing and acting um yeah i mean the reasons why i also started writing treatments is is um i'm investing in stories that i want to uh create myself as a filmmaker in the future yeah um directing yes um, but acting first. Okay. Yeah. And um, because I did it in theater, I wrote for myself, I acted myself. Yeah, yeah. So who can better tell that emotional, that story than yeah. I do? Right. So, yeah, but I'm reserving my th that part of my life for my 40s because I would like to have uh, enough weight as an actor. Or... I, have my name be a platform for investors to, to, to pitch a story to get investment. Okay, yeah. You know? So that's my goal. So I'm working on my career, so I better be fucking <laughs> successful as an actor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sounds like you're doing interesting work. I mean, your homeboy, um, Justin Chan, shout out to Justin. Yeah. He did uh, Gook. Have you seen that yet? Or? Uh, yes, I've seen the rough cut. But oh, I, I saw the rough um, cut, okay. But I haven't seen it in, in the theaters yet. I want to, I, like, he was like, yeah, I don't watch it. I'm like, yeah, I know. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna want to wait. I want to watch it in the theater with an audience. You oh, know, really? That kind of thing, yeah. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah. Uh, it's, um, not to spoil it, but yeah, it's good. It's, it's, it's very well received, I think, especially not just Asian American community, but yeah. community at large. Yeah. Because, uh, kind of like these sub histories, right? Yeah. This is a very recent history. This is in his li our lifetimes, right? Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. But no one's really told about the Korean LA riots. I mean, the LA riots from a Korean perspective, which yeah. is kind of ridiculous because yeah. they were probably one of the most, if not the most affected yeah. by the riots. Yeah. They got looted and all that. So, yeah. um, I mean, yeah. So I, I thought that was interesting. So, but I, what I saw, thought was interesting is like, damn, he's writing, directing, and acting in it. Yeah. That's... Um, I don't know, Dan, Dan and I have had this conversation, like, that's a lot of duties to take on. Yeah. Um, but you're saying that that might be something maybe in your 40s that you might take on. Um, well, it depends. Well, we'll see what we well, get I there. Put, yeah. well, well, the reason why I would say um, in my 40s is because that's the like kind of like my imaginary timeline where I'm famous enough to do it. Sure, sure, yeah. If I become famous earlier than that, then I would do it earlier. Okay. So, um, but I'm going to do it eventually. Wow, so, yeah. that's your game plan or your, yeah. your goal. Yeah. yeah, so I'm writing it also for the for the protagonist, for me to be in it as the pro protagonist, um, where I don't have to have like a certain age line to be cast in. So ah. it's a very um, universal story. I mean, it's not easy to invest, to research in something like that, but, you know, I'm, I'm on a good way. I mean, I'm very confident in my stories, so... Okay. Dan, sorry, I've been taking over for a bit. Do you have anything to add, or? No, no, it's just uh, I'm I'm missing every other word. I think. Oh, that oh, sucks. sucks. <laughs> um, well, we can wrap it up uh, here. Let me 
Let me, let's yeah. do a, a edit here. Hey, you wanna just do audio then? It may be best. All right, let's just do audio. Okay, well, we'll, we'll kind of finish it up with a few last questions then. Um, Dan, so did you have anything to add to that or? Uh, no, but uh, okay. maybe you should ask <laughs> Keo to take you out to uh, some clubs. Oh my gosh. <laughs> It's uh, fine. I went to I've done uh, it one once yet. in Korea, so you should go. Okay. Um. Okay. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. And we're back. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Um. But one thing I was gonna ask. Um. Okay. Yeah. Dan. Good. Good point. Um. I do wanna. I'll do a whole like Korea Taiwan episode when I get back. I guess. Well, I'll talk about <laughs> my experiences. Yeah. I did. I did go to like a bar last night. I tried to, you know, talk to some ladies. Um. It was tough, but, um, but, uh, uh, one thing I was gonna, okay. You, you mentioned one thing I kind of wrap it up was a little bit about, I think a lot of artists or a lot of, um, a lot of people, uh, uh -huh. deal with, um, feelings of displacement, loneliness or yeah. melancholy. Yeah. Um, so what are some of the tools that, Cause that's something we do talk about a little bit on mm -hmm. this on this podcast is about mental health a little bit. Like, mm -hmm. what do you do? I guess what are some of the tools you do to stay centered and stay focused on, like, stay? I guess being present and being happy in the moment. Like, what what are some of the tools that you found? I guess you mentioned writing, yeah. Yeah, writing is one of the things. Um, I think um, lately uh, it is. In a classical sense, I would say it would be meditation. Oh. But um, um, but that's something that I've lately stumbled upon by reading about Eckhart Tolle. I don't know if you heard about that guy. Um, Sounds familiar. So he's like a spiritual spiritual leader, writer, philosopher also. Um, and I stumbled upon him via the craziness of uh, Jim Carrey's interviews lately. <laughs> and, yeah, his yeah. interviews are great. Yeah, so yeah. I wanted to know what that is all coming from. And then, you know, I, I found about I found out about this German born. Um, he lived part of his youth in, 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 in Spain, then later in Britain, and then went over to Canada and the United States. Um, so he's a writer. And yeah, basically he's much about spirituality and how to live in the present moment. Mm. And um, yeah, that helped me a lot, you know, because to paraphrase his words, he's saying he, he was um, in, a, in a time of his life when he, when he was very depressed, he was saying, you know, I can't live, I can't live with myself anymore and yeah. he wanted to commit suicide. Yeah. But um, there was a moment where he thought about, okay, this grammatical structure of saying i can't live with myself anymore so where's the uh, who's the i and who's myself mm. so he basically separated the two in the sentence structure so, so i can't live with myself anymore and um basically to give it in a nutshell from the way i perceive him is um he was saying that the history of our language it's about 60,000 years old. Human language. Yeah, the okay. history of human language. Which means the history of compart compartmentalizing mm. thought is also only as old as that, maybe even younger. Yeah. You know? And um, so before that, we lived with very basic um, intuitive needs and intuitive action right yeah we yeah like an so, animal yeah, yeah like an animal exactly yeah. we want to eat fuck eat, yeah sleep. exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so um basically what he's saying is that um our thoughts are not our identity but our thoughts are the structures of the language and the social surroundings that the language created okay so we we are not supposed to mistake our negative thoughts for our being for who we are mm. you know and um that what we feel negatively what we think about you know about the traumas of our past about the worries about our future you know 
our emotion emotional life comes from that process of thought mm. you know rather than really being present in the moment without all those worries so that that, that rang a bell with me that, that kind of struck a chord with me so it helped me a lot being very balanced and centered because based on that you know it's it's easier to be just present mm. if you don't if you untrain yourself to worry about the traumas of the past to worry o- about what happens in the future you know just worry about thought in general so, worry about thought in g- okay yeah worry about thought in general because uh i guess w- so if there's anything sorry yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. a lot to process worry right about thought. i'm trying to look at the sentence structure there so yeah. like worry so thought thought as the actual that that actually um uh, having those negative thoughts yeah um is something you should worry about having i guess it's like or or just let it just let it be or like just let those thoughts be but but kind of disassociate that with your idea of who you are or yourself like oh oh shit i fucked up um i'm a terrible person so that's yeah, maybe yeah. a certain pattern right? yeah 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 so then you're saying if instead of worrying about are you really a terrible person more about worry about that thought of thinking you are a terrible person maybe. yeah okay interesting yeah i mean and to come back to your question also like um where do i find, find that balance in that loneliness i mean uh yeah i I don't know i um ever since i'm more present i don't feel as lonely anymore because loneliness is also only a construct that i made for myself Mm -hmm. because i feel like other people don't understand me so with that comes a lot of fear and a lot of worry but if i don't worry about that i can just express myself honestly and directly and sincerely Mm -hmm. so um without being worried about if the other person understands me or not you know okay so and i feel like the worry itself makes the other person not understand me as clearly clear clearly as um in a position when i don't worry about it and i just express myself maybe the person understands me better you know right instead of worrying about yeah. the outcome exactly right, yeah. instead yeah. of worrying about the outcome which yeah. is also I guess kind of Bruce Lee's philosophy. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, th- which is not uh, easy because we are so trained into thinking a certain way. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But um, I'm in a good place right now. You think? Yeah, good. <laughs> Dan, did you have anything to add to that? or? Dan, are you there? <laughs> Dan said goodbye. I'm Dan. here, but I, I'm, again, I'm missing like every other word. Oh, okay. Man. Oh man. Um. Well, let's go ahead. Let's wrap it up with. Uh. Do you have any last questions? Uh, no. Yeah, I think that that I think it's a good place to end. I mean, um, I always do feel it's, especially as artists or creators, it's very easy to seek validation from an audience, from mm. a if you're an actor, from a, the director. Or producers and say, "Oh, hey, am I am I good enough?" Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think what you mentioned is kind of that idea of being okay with yourself first, instead of worrying about what other people think about you. Is yeah. is, is that a paraphrasing, or is that is that safe to say? Or I mean, you should still be respectful to other people, mm-hmm. and you know. But I think what you mentioned is like first expressing yourself honestly. Uh, and truthfully and you know not caring too much about uh, what other people think i mm. guess is that a, 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 a approach that you're that has helped you um not in a sense the way you um the you the way you structured it because it implicates that um an audience that I cater to, ah. which I don't worry about in general. It's it's more about how I was in my own head and and how I'm not in in my own space any like in, like about. I mean, it's hard it's hard to explain. It's um. I think I um, because my aunt, I guess my constructing that sentence yeah. already implies that 
there is a focus on the audience or a focus on this other yeah, that you're trying yeah, to yeah. please. I yeah. Guess. yeah. Yeah. So this is like really deep psychology, psychological stuff because, yeah, yeah. because it's like, you know, I'm saying I'm not doing it for um, the reaction of the other, but you know, it's also ironic because, you know, I live within that context of the <laughs> other as well. So, um, but, but, to come back to your question, um, yeah, it's just being about um, being myself, I guess, you know, being just being myself and being honest with myself. Mm. That's, that's, I think, the most important thing, just being honest with myself, to myself, um, about myself, which is not always very easy, but, right. you know. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to, yeah, yeah, I think we're all trying to strive for. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so the last section we do is something called uh, Language Corner. Yay, okay. Language Corner. Hey. Yeah, where we share a uh, phrase from uh, a language that we know or are studying. Uh, let's see. Uh, Dan, did you have any uh, phrase prepared today? No. Or anything that you've been thinking about? No. Because, <laughs> uh, uh, okay, well, I guess... Um, this is a very important phrase, uh, probably, if not the most important phrase. Um, uh, right? So that's Mandarin. is where's the bathroom, right? Mm -hmm. so, so in 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 Taiwanese, which I spoke a little bit when I was a kid, and I forgot uh, the dial uh, the dialect would be bian uh, bian so de 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 so it's totally different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Teso Zai Nali. Teso is bathroom. Zai is the um, location verb. Zai Nali where? Teso Zai Nali Bian So the Doi. And in correct me if I'm saying this correct mm -hmm. uh, so I learned this in Korea while I've been traveling here is a Kwajang Shil Odieo. Oh that's pretty good. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. yes, yay. Kwajang Shil I've I've been practicing that a lot because uh I drink a lot of water and I gotta go pee, so I, I learned that quickly. I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's my phrase of today: uh, is uh, where is the bathroom in the uh, Zai Nali Mandarin, Bian So the Doi Taiwanese, and Kwa Jang Shil Odieyo. It's uh, Korean, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> um, Dan or uh, Teo, did you have anything? Or? I continue that sentence into German: Wo ist die Toilette? And then I'm going to continue that sentence into Russian. Gde toilet. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the toilet? Okay. Is, and is it the same? It, uh, I'm curious for those languages. Is it? Are they saying where is the toilet or is the bathroom or like? Uh, I think toilet is more universal. Yeah, ah. we're using toilet. We have a slang in German where we say Klo. Wo ist das Klo? Where's the closet or no it's it means where where's the toilet yeah ah, cool yeah bathroom bathroom is a very american thing to it's say it's a very yeah. yeah yeah or washroom is very british i think yeah or, i guess yeah, so yeah. dan yeah do you, yeah do you have anything in japanese whatever? it would be like um like like everything else is toilet what do this car toilet toilet is like a take on toilet <laughs> yeah Right, I guess bathroom, restroom, washroom. This is very, I guess, I don't know. It's very, uh, maybe Western thing. I don't know. I, I'd have to look at the etymology, but yeah, toilet seems more universal, like you mentioned. Mm. <laughs> so okay, there we go. We uh, where is the toilet in in many languages? And go ahead, go out and use that in the world. Um, Teo, thank you so much for your time thank today. You. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Was... Thank you for having me. Sorry for the technical Thanks. difficulties. Cool. All right. <laughs> no, that's all right. Cool. All right, Dan. So I'll see you when I get back to the States. And uh, so we're going to do a little sign off. So um, this is James, a.k.a. Dan, Young, AKA signing, Young off. signing off. And Teo, a.k.a. <laughs> Teo, signing off. <laughs> Cheers. Thank, thank you, you so much. much for listening. Bye. Go clubbing.